So today I'm going to be talking about oxygen extraction and mapping to improve care in cerebrovascular disease. And um, so these are my disclosures. None of these are relevant today. So I'm not going to be talking about any of the, the trials that we have going on um, with regard to the consulting agreements. And the objectives of the talk um, are kind of threefold. So first, I'm going to start by reviewing the pathogenesis of cerebrovascular disease. And uh, the way that we usually think about this and where most of the work is focused is on vasculopathy. So that's generally narrowing of the blood vessel through steno occlusion. That leads to reduced blood oxygen delivery, reduced blood delivery, but um, in the face of sort of normal oxygen carrying capacity. And then what I'm gonna think I'm gonna talk about is a little bit about anemia or mostly about anemia, I should say. And that's kind of the opposite. So that's actually normal blood delivery in many situations, um, but reduced oxygen carrying capacity. And uh, since this is a sort of imaging cerebral physiology group, I'm gonna talk about really imaging physiology in the presence of anemia. So in, in really specifically sickle cell disease and some of the exciting work that's going on, um, both that we're doing as well as at other groups. And I'll focus on evaluating treatment responses. And this is kind of an exciting time in sickle cell because we have different disease modifying and curative treatments that are becoming available. And imaging stands to really show how those treatments are working and how you can triage patients for those treatments. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some novel mechanisms of oxygen delivery in sickle cell disease. And at the end, I'll just have a few slides on kind of some recent extensions, specifically looking at chorea plexus function and um, potentially some glymphatic physiology as well in the presence of sickle cell disease. So, and then I'll, I'll just end with kind of a few future directions, expanding the definition of oxygen delivery in the presence of anemia, and then also kind of the role of imaging in interventional clinical trials more broadly and some of the experiences that we've had with that. Okay, so starting with kind of the, the general outline of our lab and what we're interested in, and th this kind of motivates all of our work in different areas. And, and I always think that, you know, serial imaging is really performed routinely in clinical practice. Um, but, you know, it's often secondary to clinical outcomes in trials. And, and the reason for that is it's, you know, it's expensive, it's difficult to standardize across sites and so forth. But you can really imagine the trial outcomes might be quite different if you had better patient stratification. Instead of just randomizing patients, you stratify them based on individual signatures of tissue physiology, which imaging can get you. And then you, know, you can really use imaging as a tool to guide um, the patient selection for interventions. And what we're really interested in doing is using imaging to evaluate how interventions are working and how they confer changes on brain health. Um, so when you can do that, then it also helps motivate that those interventions are important and that they're doing something meaningful rather than just changing symptoms, which could be due to a, a number of different things. And what we work on is not just using standard anatomical imaging, which sort of most diagnostic radiology um, centers will use, but also developing and applying sort of more novel functional methods that will really be sensitive to changes that those interventions might um, impose. Okay, so um, for this talk, I'm gonna be talking mostly about cerebrovascular disease and stroke. And, you know, in the past, we used to think of stroke as a cerebrovascular accident, um, and that's really not, not that terminology isn't really used anymore at all. And that's because it's not an accident at all. It's very well-defined risk factors. Those risk factors are, lots of them are well-known, things like environmental lifestyle factors and so forth. Um, those are the major things I would say. And then from an imaging perspective, um, vascular patency. So looking at um, the, the patency of the vessel, how open it is or closed it is. And then maybe with vessel wall imaging, you can even look at plaque and plaque vulnerability. And then what we're really interested in is taking this this information and seeing how it imposes changes at the tissue level. So how does the brain compensate for these macrovascular diseases? And, and then the brain is very clever about that. So it can do a very good job of compensating or not. So we're really interested in studying what's going on at the tissue level in response to these other factors. And those are the things that can also change in response to treatments. Um, so just as a brief background, people here will, will mostly know this, I assume but um, blood delivery to the brain, which will be affected in cerebrovascular disease. So most of the blood comes from the, the right and the left internal carotid arteries. They will perfuse the anterior circulation. So I've just shown those, those vessels here um, from, a, from a catheter angiogram in one of our patients. Most of the blood comes from those vessels. And then you also have a, a minority um, that comes from the retrieval basilar system, perfuses the back of the brain. And those perfusion maps will look something like this. 
Um, typical adult brain weights are between like 1300, 1400 grams or so. And what that means is that a typical cerebral blood flow in the brain is, is generally about 40 to 60 mils per 100 grams per minute. So that's the rate that the blood is delivered to the tissue. And anything below that, you start to get into regions of ischemia. And anything above that, you start to get into regions of hyperemia. Um, okay, so that's going on. That's what's going on in the, in the large vessels. And then if you zoom into kind of what's going on in the smaller vessels, the microvasculature, it looks something like this. And this is a, an image taken from um, chinchilla uh, microvasculature using um, uh, scanning electron microscopy, I believe. And what they did is they looked at you know what goes on in the small vessels in the brain. And again, as people here will know, if you look at the, the total region of, a, of, of the parenchyma, the blood and tissue combined, it's about 5% blood volume or so. And about 30% of that is on the arterial side and about 70% of that is on the venous side. Uh, on the arterial side, you have this nice smooth muscle that surrounds the vessels and that allows for active vasodilation and constriction so that, that smooth muscle can relax in order to increase blood flow to the surrounding tissue. And that's um, so-called autoregulation. And then the veins, veins can, um, can, can sort of dilate much less, I would say. So when we talk about things, you know, today I'll be talking about the blood volume, that's the fraction of blood that's in the brain, the blood flow, that's the rate that it's delivered, and then also the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, that's the oxygen that's actually consumed at the tissue level. And if we think about that oxygen consumption rate, um, it's generally um, about 50 mils of oxygen per minute, and that's maybe 20 to 25 percent of the whole um, body, actually, so it's a large fraction of that. And then if we think about it as, that as a rate, it's generally reported between about three to 3.5 mils of oxygen per 100 grams of tissue per minute. And if you go much below that, um, then you start um, you know, you know, getting into regions of cognitive impairment and so forth. So this is kind of a, a typical expected range for this based largely on the historical pet literature. Okay, so for the talk today, um, I, I decided to do something a little bit more novel and not just talk about basic arterial stenal occlusive disease, which causes most strokes, you know, narrowing of the blood vessels, but talking about anemia and how our understanding of anemia is improving how we think about oxygen delivery and um, supervascular disease in the brain. So one of the most common causes of anemia um, that we study anyways is sickle cell disease. And sickle cell disease is a global term. And what that means is that we it refers to lots of different sickle genotypes. So usually healthy people have hemoglobin A and sickle cell disease, you can have different sickle hemoglobins. So that can be SS. That's the most common and severe form. And if you have SS, then that's called sickle cell anemia. But there are also other variants as well. They're all grouped together into this global term of sickle cell disease. What happens here is that it creates crescent uh, red cells and those can aggregate and block blood flow. So I've just shown an example here of what um, the, the sickled erythrocytes look like relative to healthy. A couple of interesting things happen here that are all a little bit different. So one is the lifespan of these sickled red cells is much less. So it's generally 10 to 20 days. That leads to hemolysis and general anemia. So you have fewer red cells overall in the sickle cell versus the controls. Um, their hemoglobin affinity curves are also shifted, so you have reduced oxygen affinity. Um, because you're anemic, you have reduced blood oxygen content, so there's less oxygen that's going there uh, for unit blood. And then also these cells can aggregate in the microvasculature and they can lead to stenoid occlusions. They can also, um, you know, also block pathways throughout the, the arterioles and the capillaries. And, you know, people usually show images of cells and so forth when they talk about this, but it's, it, it's important to to kind of get an idea for what these patients go through as well. And I've just taken some images of patients off of the, the different sickle cell websites. These patients, lots of them have to come in for monthly blood transfusions. Every three to four weeks you come in, um, you get a blood transfusion in order to increase your hemoglobin, reduce your hemoglobin S. That leads to iron overload, it's expensive, leads to infection. Um, some patients will get stem cell transplants. This is an example of a patient getting a, a stem cell transplant, which I'll talk about. What happens here is you have to um, totally ablate or partially ablate the bone marrow. And then you, if you engraft from a donor, an AA or an AS donor, then it's, it's essentially a, a, a cure for sickle cell disease. But also because you're ablating the bone marrow, it carries risks of death and other complications. So um, that's also relatively serious, um, but has great upsides. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is that about half of all persons in the world with sickle cell disease live in Nigeria alone. And Vanderbilt has a number of grants led by Michael Devon in which we are also working with hospitals in Nigeria 
where the sickle cell disease burden is highest to try and improve care in those patients based on the findings that we are um, developing here at Vanderbilt. And that, that leads to kind of an interesting um, question about um, sort of reverse innovation, I guess. And this is just a cartogram, which is kind of a fancy word for a picture of the world based on uh, uh, the sort of burden of sickle cell disease, newborns with sickle cell. Um, so if the country is bigger, that means that there are more newborns. So you can see kind of what the United States looks like here, Western Europe, and then what Africa looks like and what India looks like. So you really get an appreciation for where the burden is highest. It is a little bit unfortunate in some ways because, you know, it's considered a rare disorder in the United States. There's less funding for sickle cell, um, but the burden is huge in Africa. And addressing this really requires a synergistic approach, um, kind of reverse innovation, as, as we like to call it in which we have to take knowledge um, from these kind of low resource settings and use it to drive our, our research and what we're looking at, and then hopefully take those findings and make them accessible to low resource settings. And in doing this, um, there's a couple of papers that have recently come out, which are kind of interesting. This one goes over reducing healthcare disparities in sickle cell disease. And they talk about you know, just these issues and that there's not as much funding for sickle cell research in the United States because it's considered an orphan disease. And, you know, they go into things like, you know, cystic fibrosis affects fewer than half the number of persons um, than sickle cell, but receives 3.5 times the funding from the NIH and a lot more funding from different foundations. And, and that's important. You know, the, the developments that you get in these, these conditions really depends on the funding that you get. So I, th I think, so, th so these slides are just kind of intended to grow a little bit of awareness for sickle cell and hopefully the, the synergistic approach that we can have for developing treatments um, here in, in sort of higher resource settings and then translating them into lower resource settings. Um, okay, so what are the treatments that we have for sickle cell and why is imaging important? So the most conservative treatment that you have for these patients is oral hydroxyurea. And what that is, is a myelosuppressive agent. You take it by mouth. It increases the hemoglobin F fraction slightly. And this is kind of first line therapy for um, patients with sickle cell. For those that are not responding to oral hydroxyurea, then you generally get monthly blood transfusions. And the patients are triaged for blood transfusions based on whether they're having ongoing pain crises, stroke, whether the TCD velocities through their MCA are elevated or not. The monthly blood transfusions, that will increase their hemoglobin by one to two grams per deciliter, uh, but it also leads to iron overload, it's costly, it's expensive, um, leads to infection. So you only wanna do it if necessary. And then, you know, a subgroup of patients will also not respond to the blood transfusion. They'll continue to have strokes um, or pain crises. And here, um, you can do more interesting and more aggressive gene or stem cell therapies. Um, what we are doing at Vanderbilt, which I'll talk a little bit about, is stem cell therapy. And this is where you have a haploidentical or hemopoietic donor, and you, um, you sort of permanently ablate the bone marrow of the patient. So you remove the ability to make hemoglobin S. And then if they engraft from the donor, then it's a, it's a cure. So they, they permanently replace their ability to make hemoglobin S with hemoglobin A. The problem is, you know, if they don't engraft, there are other complications that can lead to death and so forth. Um, so, so the real question here is, do the benefits, you know, sort of achieving this cure outweigh the risks associated with that cure? And unlike, you know, bloodborne cancers or so forth, you're not necessarily going to die from sickle cell in the next year or so. So you really have to weigh, you know, the risk and the benefit of these more aggressive genetic therapies. And that's what I think imaging can really help to do, is to show which patients really need these and then confirming that they actually affect brain health. And that's what we're, we're kind of interested in doing here at Vanderbilt in this, in this area. We have a large imaging initiative where we've scanned, um, I think here about 200 people, but I think we're up to about 250 now as part of our, our sickle cell clinic. And what I wanna emphasize as part of this is that if you look at sort of the prevalence of intracranial stenosis, a so typical stroke risk factor, narrowing of the blood vessel, only about 10 to 15% of these patients have that. Much fewer have cervical stenosis, problem with the, the cervical vessels, small fraction of microbleeds, tissue volumes are almost normal, but almost half of these patients will have infarcts, silent or overt, by time they are 30 years old. So whatever is causing these infarcts, it's not traditional stroke risk factors. It's something else um, that's causing them. And that's what we're kind of interested in looking at um, at the tissue level. These projects are also partly led by Lori Jordan, who's a pediatric neurologist. And these are also members of the team involved in coordination and, and data analysis. Um, so we use imaging to do this. 
we have gotten a very small minority of resistance doing MRI in sickle cell disease patients because there's been a paper published in 1986, I believe it was, in investigative radiology showing that hemoglobin S red cells will, will sort of align preferentially in a magnetic field. And if so, they can cause steno occlusion. So there was some concern that you shouldn't do MRIs in sickle cell patients because it can cause stroke. So what uh, we actually had an undergraduate student, Olivia Justice, look at this from our, our data in about 200 patients or 172 patients. And she looked at um, with a radiologist how often there are acute lesions on DWI in those patients. And if you look at sort of chronic lesions with age, it goes up, you know, about 45% or so of those patients have that by age 45 or so. But if you look at these acute silent cerebral ischemic events, so how many have an acute event in the scanner, it's, it's totally zero. We didn't observe any of those, as you might expect, um, but just as kind of a prerequisite to the studies that we're going to do, just to, to kind of know that there's, there's no evidence to our knowledge that MRI causes any strokes in uh, sickle cell disease. Most people don't think that either. So what's going on in the patients that potentially causes the strokes? And I'm going to talk about this in terms of the oxygen extraction fraction, which is the oxygen consumed by the brain relative to the oxygen that's delivered. And the oxygen that's consumed, that's the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen. So maybe three to 3.5 mils of oxygen per 100 grams of tissue per minute. And then the oxygen delivered, that is the product of the cerebral blood flow, um, how much hemoglobin is in that blood, and then how much oxygen is bound to that hemoglobin. So if you're anemic, your hemoglobin will go down, and then to compensate for that, your blood flow will go up. And if that's totally compensatory, then your oxygen extraction fraction should be about normal, assuming the oxygen consumption is the same. If you can increase your blood flow by quite enough in order to offset that, that, that hemoglobin, then your oxygen extraction fraction will start to go up. Or if your CMR2 starts to reduce, then your OEF could go down. So those are kind of the factors that we're looking at here. And to guide this, uh, you know, historically, there's data from the PET literature looking at sickle cell patients. It's small. So they did six sickle cell patients with O15 PET, which is generally considered the gold standard for oxygen extraction, CMR2 mapping. And they did 14 control, or 14 controls, yeah. And what they found is that, you know, in sickle cell, which is shown here with an S, the blood flow is elevated, just like what we, did, we thought to offset the, the anemia and the reduced oxygen carrying capacity. Blood volume was also increased. But what they found is that the oxygen extraction fraction um, and the oxygen consumption are really not significantly different from controls. They're like 42, 44% uh, for the oxygen extraction fraction. Uh, these are also patients with no neurological impairment. Um, so they were kind of healthier sickle cell patients as well, I should say. Uh, but this has kind of guided our, our initial thought with what might be going on. Sort of not much of a change in oxygen extraction in CMR2. Um, and then, you know, O15 PET is a, is a big pain. It's expensive, you need an arterial line, you need an onsite cyclotron. Um, so, you know, we want to be able to do this with MR. Um, for this audience, you know, you can do this with arterial spin labeling. And if you take a sickle cell patient versus a healthy control, the blood flow is elevated in the sickle cell patient versus the control. Also, the angios look beautiful. So you have very patent vessels in sickle cell usually compared with control. So that's relatively easy to measure now. And the bigger question is, how can we measure the oxygen extraction, which is kind of a balance of really everything that's going on, right? It's a balance of the oxygen consumed, oxygen delivered. And there are a number of ways that people are doing this now. The way that I'm going to talk about today primarily is by comparing the amount of oxygen going into the brain through the arteries, and we do that with pulse oximetry, and then comparing that with the amount of the oxygen leaving the brain through the veins, and we can do that with a, a quantitative T2 measurement in the veins. And just sort of graphically how this looks, if you have a region with pure blood in it, and it's got kind of a mix of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. Deoxyhemoglobin is, is paramagnetic, oxyhemoglobin is diamagnetic. You'll, if you plot your signal in this box, it'll look you know, something like this maybe. And then if you have more deoxyhemoglobin there, that will lower your signal, right? So that will cause more dephasing. You'll get a faster T2. So what we're trying to do is really isolate the pure blood, quantify the T2, and that will tell us something about what the oxygenation level is in that, in that region. That method has been proposed by Han Zong Lu. So it was initially proposed, I think, back in, in 2008 or so. And the general idea with this is you um, do a spin labeling prep. So you label the veins and so not the arteries. You label the veins. And then you do another acquisition where you don't label anything. And then you're going to get data with different um, T2 weightings. And this is done here with the T2 preparation module. Um, it's similar to like a, a, a T2 prep that you would use for a 3D flare. And you can just vary the duration of that T2 prep 
And that gives you different T2 weightings and it's non-selective. So it's less sensitive to inflow and outflow. You do that subtraction and you can isolate pure venous blood. And then you can fit the signal to that. And that gives you a T2 in the pure venous blood. And then if you know the, the T2 and you can get the hematocrit from, uh, from just like a blood uh, a venipuncture or so forth, then you can look up what the oxygenation is because there have been calibration studies that have looked at the relationship between the hematocrit, the T2, and you can look that up. So that's generally the idea. Uh, to, to measure the oxygenation that way. Now, as a, a short aside for this, for this, um, for this group, um, there is a fundamental question about whether the, that calibration curve is the same for red cells that have hemoglobin A versus red cells that have hemoglobin S. And when we, we first published this paper in sickle cell disease in 2016, um, we used this bovine model which assumes, you know, in that case, that the bovine blood has a similar relaxation profile as the hemoglobin S blood. And that wasn't necessarily a guess. We actually, if you, if you look in the supplementary material there, we actually made measurements um, in the blood. And we actually found some of the patients that had very similar um, oxygenation levels and very similar overall hematocrit, but very different hemoglobin S fractions. And we found that those decay curves were actually pretty similar. So they weren't significantly different. And um, a, you know, a better study has come out more recently from the Wash U group led by Hong Yu An, where she has actually quantified the magnetic susceptibility in hemoglobin S and hemoglobin A water, and she's found no significant difference there as well. Um, the other question is, you know, those initial calibration models actually weren't thinking about anemia, which is fine. They were thinking about normal blood. So they actually only went down to a hematocrit of about 35%. So the question is, are they actually accurate? if you extrapolate down to lower um, hematocrits and sickle cell patients will have hematocrits of 20 to 30%. And that's a, a probably good question. Um, so interesting study just came out actually that, that partially addresses this. This is um, from Den Rong Zheng, who's an organizer of this meeting. And what he did is he, he compared the, the, the trust measurements that you get um, to kind of gold standard blood gas measurements from catheterizing the, the sagittal sinus and he found that you actually get very good correspondence um, between those two measures. And he used um, a number of different models, but one of the models was the, the bovine model. And what's interesting about that is that the piglets actually have a low hematocrit. So they have a hematocrit that's about um, similar to an anemic sickle cell patient. So it provides some data in some ways that um, there's actually is some accuracy when you extrapolate down to lower hematocrits. There's an interesting large literature actually on on piglet anemia from the farming industry, you can, you can look it up too. Okay, but it's, it's also not totally unreasonable at all that hemoglobin S would have different relaxation profiles than hemoglobin A or bovine blood. And another group, um, Adam Bush and, and John Wood out at USC, they've also made some measurements and they looked at making these calibration curves again in sickle cell blood. And the problem there is that it's very difficult to spin down that blood and also to deoxygenate and reoxygenate it. So they made the calibration, but it was only over a relatively small hematocrit range. And there's nothing really wrong with that. Like we've done these experiments too, and it's, it's just, they're just very difficult experiments to do. But what ends up happening is you don't get much of a hematocrit dependence in your model. So it, it leads to some bias when you're operating really outside these hematocrit ranges. And what they found in their paper is that the, the oxygen extraction fraction um, and sickle cell is actually quite low. So it's about 24% they're reporting relative to kind of what other models report and what the PET data reported kind of between, you know, maybe 34 and 45% or so. Um, and then the, the last slide on this side is a controversial topic in, the, in this literature. So I just want to make sure it's covered well here is at Johns Hopkins, um, Chin Chin and, and, and Wenbo Lee have done a nice study where they actually got personalized blood measurements in different sickle cell patients. And they showed that if you could actually individual measurements in every patient, do a calibration per patient, then you can actually get pretty good OEF measures between the observed and the calculated oxygenation. And in their sickle cell patients, which are relatively healthy, so no strokes or anything, uh, their OEF is about 38% that they calculated. And a recent study has now come out merging the, the data from the Bush model, which I showed in the previous slide in sickle cell patients with, with these data. And the, I, th I think this has now been called by some a a consensus model where they've included both of these data points. Uh, but really what you, you get with this, unfortunately, is that you have one model that kind of provides normal OEF, another one that provides quite low OEF. And then if you merge them, you get something kind of in the middle. And when, if you actually, this wasn't done in the paper, but if you, if you kind of stick on where the curves are for these different plots, like for the, 
for the Lee study, um, you kind of have the black dots here, and then you can see for the Bush study, it's a little bit flatter. Um, same thing here. So it's it's um they're kind of a merge model, but but the models kind of show things that are a little bit different, unfortunately. So I've just kind of shown kind of what the oxygen extraction fraction ranges are for all of these different models. Generally, you know, starting with the PET, it's it's low 40s or so in sickle cell disease. Most models, including another MR method from Andrea Ford and Hong Yu and at WashU, report values kind of mid 30s to low 40s. Um, and then this this hemoglobin S model from John Wood also reports. Um, lower OEF. So that's kind of where we stand with the models. Uh, so um, so when, when, when I present the data, I will try and present the data um, in the context of what happens if you if you use these different models. And the big question that we want to know is, you know, does the oxygen extraction fraction, does it have anything to do with prognosis? Um, so do the patients that have higher OEF or lower, do they do um, better or worse? And what we initially did is we took controls. Um, so these are African-American controls, compared them with sickle cell participants that are less impaired. So they have no prior strokes or vasculopathy. Sickle cell participants that are more impaired, they do have strokes, vasculopathy. And what we found is that you have a in gradient of increasing OEF um, between the different groups. This increased OEF in the more impaired participants is observed whether you use the bovine model or the human hemoglobin A model or the uh, hemoglobin F model, any model except the hemoglobin S model, in which case this goes way down here, I would say. Um, and then what's interesting is that if you look at the blood flow, it's actually not different between less and more impaired. So that's because there's lots of different things that are that are causing the blood flow to increase or decrease, and that could be vasculopathy or compensatory effects to the anemia. So it's actually not so good for discriminating between these two groups. So it gives us some, some thought that maybe oxygen extraction fraction is a good biomarker in these patients. Again, this is just going back to the different models. So if you if you quantify these values with the hemoglobin F or the A model, the merged model, the A model, the F model or the merged model, the absolute values are a little bit different with all these, but they're all pretty well correlated. Okay, so that's something to kind of keep in mind in interpreting the results. Okay, so if the OEF in the in, in the in the blood flow are elevated, um, you know, potentially pathologically, or they're or they're reduced, then you would expect that a treatment such as a blood transfusion, which will increase the hemoglobin by a few grams per deciliter, will affect those parameters. And that's what we looked at as well. So if you look at the blood flow in adults, and you look at those before transfusion and right after transfusion, goes down a little bit, but interestingly, it's not actually that significant. And then if you take kids and you do the same thing, it goes down by a lot more, actually. And what we think is that potentially adults, they're older, they're operating in more extreme stages of hemodynamic impairment, and they just they just sort of don't normalize by quite enough, even though you increase their oxygen um, content with the transfusion. Um, but, you know, we know even in the adults that the transfusion um, reduces risk of subsequent strokes and so forth. So e even though we don't see this big change here, um, we know that it's doing something. And that what that means is that, you know, potentially there's a different effect that this has on oxygen delivery than just uh, uh, or potentially there's a different effect that um, blood flow has on oxygen delivery than, than just what you'll see here. And that's what we've, we've kind of started looking at. Um, oh yeah, so what, one more slide on this. Uh, so what, what I've been showing so far is the, is the transfusions. And just so you can see this kind of graphically, if you have a, a blood flow map in a healthy person with something like this, blood flow is maybe 60 mils per 100 grams per minute. You have a sickle cell disease patient. So now the blood flow is super high because the hemoglobin's low. So you're upregulating to offset that oxygen delivery. You transfuse them, just like what I showed in the previous slide, and it goes down, but just a little bit, right? So the hemoglobin goes up a little bit, blood flow goes down a little bit. Um, and, and, and like I showed, on average, it sometimes doesn't even change. And then the other thing that you can do is you can transplant them, right? So you ablate the bone marrow, you then give them an, a, a donor, uh, that's an AA or an AS donor, and that's essentially a permanent cure, and it will increase your hemoglobin back up to almost normal levels. And when you do that, you can see that your blood flow um, almost normalizes as well. This patient also has more and more vasculopathy, so it doesn't look quite normal. Uh, but you can see kind of what a large effect the transplant has on brain health and blood flow compared with just a transfusion. And we've now done 19 of these patients. Um, I'm, just, I'm just showing the four that are from this paper here. Uh, but what we see in all four of them before and after the transplant now is that you go way down in your blood flow and your oxygen extraction fraction also goes way down. Uh, okay. So 
what are the reasons why the, the patients might be doing better when they get the transfusions, but uh, their blood flow isn't changing by all that much on average? Um, and what we started noticing in these patients is that if you look at their ASL signal, it, uh, lots of them have these kind of really bright dural hyperintensities on the ASL. And people here will probably know what this is due to, but generally what happens is if you have an ASL experiment, um, you're gonna label the blood water. So everything coming in is gonna be inverted. So your magnetization is gonna be low now. Um, so the opposite of M0 will come in. There will be kind of good exchange in the capillaries. Um, water that ends up in, or starts in the tissue will come back. And that, that water will have a similar magnetization as if you didn't do anything, right? So if you subtract these two and you look at the veins, then you won't see much signal in the veins. And that's what we usually see about in, in ASL experiments with typical labeling parameters. Uh, but suppose, you know, the blood's coming in at super high velocity because they're anemic, they have high blood flow. So now the blood's coming in very quickly. Um, the exchange process is a little bit off in the tissue. So some of that water moves straight through into the veins and that will lower your magnetization of the veins. And if you compare that with the control, you now have some bright signal here. And this is what we think is probably happening in these patients. This is what this looks like if you look at a few of them. So this is a, um, a person that has really none of this effect. So a couple axial slices here, you don't see much in the sagittal sinus. You can then take a patient that has a little bit of an effect. So you can kind of see it starting up here. You can see it in sort of the anterior part of the superior sagittal sinus. Um, we give these people like a score of one or so initially. We have an ordinal scoring system for this. And we can also calculate the signal there. And then um, some people have it really bad. So you can see it going all the way down to the confluence of the, of the transverse sinuses, and the torcula down there. And you can see it you know, quite bright here as well. So we have this kind of ordinal scoring system that we started looking at there. If it is due to accelerated transit time, then you would expect it to scale with the flow velocity. So we've measured flow velocity with phase contrast. You can see that when they have this effect, it's higher and then when they don't, does that make sense? Also, it increases with the cerebral blood flow. So it makes a lot of sense that it has something to do with flow velocity in these patients. Um, so how might that affect oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption? And this is just a theory, so it's not totally shown yet, but you know, we have blood that comes into the, to the arterial system, into the capillaries. There's restricted exchange, it moves out, and your venous oxygenation is usually about 60 to 70% or so on average. If you have hyperemia, like an anemia, you got a, you know, got a big blood flow coming in, it's possible that that, you know, now the blood volume is higher, the blood comes in, but it still moves kind of at a reasonable rate through the capillaries where you get normal oxygen delivery. But suppose that it's going so fast through here that the actual, that the red cell spends less time in the capillaries and the time you know, the, the ability of your, of your red cells to offload oxygen partly depends on the amount of time that they spend to traverse the capillary bed. So this time is too short, then it's possible they don't have quite enough time to deliver their oxygen and you actually get reduced oxygen delivery even in the presence of hyperemia. And this may or may not occur, uh, but it does seem to be the case that there is accelerated transit. So what does it look like if you measure the oxygen extraction fraction with these people? Well, on the left, if you look at the blood flow, in this sort of hyperintensity score. So again, you know, the, the bigger scores here are indicative of faster flow, most likely. And here in the controls, you know, there's really no effect here and nobody has kind of extreme shunting effects. And then if you take the sickle cell patients, you can see that there's this gradient of increasing blood flow with increasing shunting effects. If you then look at the oxygen extraction fraction, you see the opposite. So you see that as the shunting effect gets higher, there's kind of this gradient of decreasing oxygen extraction fraction um, in those participants. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of correlative. It would be interesting to know if you gave them an intervention, whether it changed these things. And we've had an undergraduate student, Tana DeBeer, who's been working on this too. So she's been looking at the um, patients uh, before and after transfusion, and then also not on a transfusion. So just kind of scanned at two time points. And here you can see the blood flow is kind of stable. And then if you scan them before and after transfusion, you sometimes see that there's a hyperintensity here and then it goes away or reduces after transfusion. And these are just the, the results of that study. So if you look at the cerebral blood flow um, on the patients not on transfusion, so it actually doesn't change very much, it's about a month apart. And then if you look at the patients on transfusion, you can see that the blood flow reduces after transfusion on average in these participants. And then if you look at the flow signal, so this is now in the dural sinuses, uh, so this kind of shunting effect doesn't change too much um, when they're just on hydroxyurea, there's no treatment or no change in treatment. And then when you give them a transfusion, you can see that it also reduces. So the, the sagittal sinus signal 
reduces on transfusion. Uh, so th this is kind of historical data as, as well. Just as a, a quick aside, we do do this in a better way now. So we didn't know we were going to see this seven years ago when we started the study. So we've now changed the protocol or extended the protocol, I should say, where we do a multi-delay ASL scan. And this is just what this looks like now as well. So you can get a feel for it. If you look pre-transfusion, different inversion times afterwards, you can see the signal starts to fill the, the dural sinus here, and then it flows out, just like you'd expect. If you do post-transfusion, um, you look kind of at the same time point here, you can see that that signal filling is much, is much more faint, and it actually takes longer to peak, and you can quantify that, right? So even after, um, so now we, we can actually quantify these effects. So pre-transfusion, you got a fast filling of the sagittal sinus. Post-transfusion, you can see it takes a little bit later to get there. And, you know, we've, we've just, We've just now been looking at how these these things affect the auction delivery, and if you look at this flow signal in the sagittal sinus, um, again potentially indicative of, of shunting, and you relate that to the auction extraction fraction before transfusion, you can see that there is this that's in blue here. You can see that there's this inverse relationship there. So people that have more of this shunting effect, they have uh, uh, reduced auction extraction efficiency. It appears. Um, interestingly, if you look post-transfusion, it depends what model you use when you use post-transfusion, but in all the models, this effect either goes away or it becomes positive. And we can talk about that in the discussion if people are interested in it, but there's a couple of reasons for why you might see a different effect there. But at the very least, I think it's safe to say that the relationship between this so-called shunting effect and the auction extraction appears to change before and after transfusion. And just in the last five minutes or so, um, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about an, an interesting extension of some of this work um, that's, that I'm not, people may not have seen quite yet. But what we, we, we scan all sorts of patients in the hospital now. So we have, I think, 27 different studies going on now with auction extraction fraction, different cohorts and whatnot. And this is a patient actually that just had a, a, a craniotomy, a chumphalovectomy. Um, it actually went a bit wrong. So there's some subdural and epidural hemorrhage um, that you can see here and here. Um, but what we see lots of times in these, in these patients that are, that are quite poor off, including the sickle cell patients, is, is this extreme hyperemia in the choroid plexus complex. So if you look in the atria of the lateral ventricles here, like a flare, you have this choroid plexus. And that's what produces the cerebral spinal fluid. It also operates at the CSF blood barrier. And lots of these patients have really elevated choroid plexus perfusion, really the, the, the most severe, not the most severe, but, but when there's other things going wrong, you often have um, choroid plexus perfusion hyperemia. And I'll just give a little bit of a background on, on, on how these structures work if you're unfamiliar with it. So um, bulk cerebral spinal fluid flow, so that's how we kind of normally think about CSF flow in, in the brain and waste clearance. That's Most of the CSF is, is produced in the in the atria of the lateral ventricles, um, and that's in the choroid plexus. There's also choroid in the, in the third ventricle and in the fourth ventricle. Um, that CSF is produced, it then flows down through the aqueduct of Sylvius. It will circulate around the brain, and it will ultimately be taken up into uh, the venous system, some of it, um, through these arachnoid granulations that exist sort of at the border of the, of the CSF and the, and the dural sinuses. Um, this CSF flow is fundamental to, to sort of protection, also inter maintaining intracranial pressure and waste clearance. This is how we've always thought about CSF flow and clearance. This model has been extended recently. Everyone here has probably heard about this in the last eight years or so. Um, this glymphatic system has been proposed in which, in addition to that bulk CSF flow model, there's also this um, glymphatic flow where there's also fluid that's flowing along these perivascular spaces. So these are this space that sort of lines the artery and the interstitial space and the astrocytes will sort of border on this side, the arteries on this side. And you have this fluid that goes through, it can move into the interstitial space through aquaporin four channels, moves through the interstitial space, can go back into the perivenous space, and then it will drain out. And it can ultimately communicate potentially with um, cerebral lymphatic vessels, maybe in the parasagal dural spaces, and then ultimately going down into the cervical lymph nodes, we think. But the, the important thing about this alternative waste clearance pathway, um, if, if it exists, is that it's really very much dependent on um, the compliance of the vasculature, right? So the arteries um, aren't pumping. You're not gonna get this good perivascular flow along here potentially. So, you know, sickle cell and stenosis actually represents an interesting way to start to think about this. 
um, because the problem is like it's very difficult to measure how do you measure perivascular flow it's very difficult and and people are starting to try it with intrathecal contrast agents but you know the other thing you can do is like what if we just enroll people that had very different vascular profiles and see whether it changes their csf profiles and that's kind of what we've done so far so we took some healthy people that have vessels that look something like this we then took patients with moya moya. So this is an intracranial vasculopathy that causes narrowing of their vessels. So you can see that they now have much poorer vascular compliance. And then sickle cell disease, which is the opposite, right? So they've got beautiful vessels, right? They're totally patent, hypervascularity. And what's kind of interesting is that they're all kind of age matched, right? So moya moya will affect young adults, sickle cell as well. And then you can enroll healthy controls there. And the moya moya and the sickle cell patients have similar ischemic burdens for the most part. So they're, they're both the patients that we've enrolled in this study have had kind of scattered nonspecific white matter lesions, but not overt stroke. So they're kind of matched in, in various ways, um, but just with very different vascularity. And the more and more patients are nice because you can revascularize them. So you can go in, you can do something called a encephaloduro arteriosynangiosis, where you will take off the skull and you will suture a vessel onto the dura of the brain and that will slowly promote new vessels to form over time. Um, so this is showing pre-revascularization and, and oblique and lateral projection of catheter angiogram. And then after you revascularize them, you can see that in the same region here, you have all these new vessels that form. So it's a way to kind of modulate the um, kind of vascular compliance within the cortex. And if you're improving kind of, you know, the, the flow and the vascularity and the neoangiogenesis of the brain, then it's quite possible that you might also change this kind of cord plexus perfusion as well and the activity of that. And that's exactly what we observe, interestingly. So if you took some of these patients and you don't give them a, a surgery, their cord plexus perfusion is kind of reproducible, looks a bit like this. And then if you take them and you revascularize them, you have this high cord plexus perfusion beforehand. And then afterwards it goes down by quite a bit. And that's in the opposite direction of the cortex, right? So afterwards when you do the revascularization, you can see that you get neoangiogenesis and increased flow there, but the cord plexus perfusion reduces, interestingly. And I should, I, sh I should have mentioned this before, but the choroid is actually perfused by branches of the anterior and posterior choroidal, choroidal artery. So they're branches that are uh, vessels that are labeled with typical PCASL labeling prep. So you, you can get this pretty well, actually. Uh, good, so what about if you do it in sickle cell? If you do it in sickle cell, you'd think, well, the, now the vessels are quite high, uh, or the, the vascularity is high, so you would have lower um, blood flow in the choroid if it's, if it's kind of relating to the to the vascular compliance um, in that way. And that's also kind of what you see. So if you take the healthy people, choroid plexus perfusion, this is shown here, an anatomical and a perfusion, and then a zoom in down below. And the choroid plexus perfusion in healthy people is generally, it's about similar to like the gray matter perfusion. You take someone with vasculopathy, more and more disease, now the perfusion is a bit higher than it is in the cortex. And if you take someone with sickle cell disease, it ends up being a bit lower than it is in the cortex. And, uh, you know, in, in the past, what we did is we just had some kind of, we do this by hand. We now have a, a graduate student, Jared Eisman, who's developed a machine learning algorithm that can automatically segment out choroid plexus from T1 or flare images. It just takes a couple of minutes and you can get out these numbers semi-automatically now. And if you look over all of these participants and healthy people, the, re the ratio of the choroid plexus to the gray matter perfusion is about one, so it's similar, but there's a bit of a variation. And then if you take people that have vasculopathies like moya moya, now the choroid plexus is higher uh, than the cortex. And then if you look at patients with sickle cell disease where the, vasculop where the, where the vascularity is really high, then the, uh, the ratio is, is, is lower again, which is kind of interesting. So you know, we don't know exactly what this is due to. We're doing additional experiments with CSF flow and whatnot, but you can think about, you know, maybe there's higher CSF production that's needed to clear perivascular fluid along less compliant perivascular spaces. So that would be consistent with this kind of glymphatic hypothesis. Um, and it may have nothing to do with that at all. It could also be that the choroid plexus responds to circulating markers of ischemic stress. And it could just be the activity of that could be upregulated in times of glial stress. But it, and that's kind of interesting. It could be kind of a central marker of um, you know, disease severity or stress on the brain. So we're looking more at that and it's and it's definitely different in patients that have different types of, of ischemia. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about, I think, as well. Right, so just to conclude, um, so sickle cell disease, it, it really represents a global health concern. Um, and interestingly, you know, half of the global cases of sickle cell are in Nigeria alone. It's really amazing. And what's exciting about it is that there are really curative treatments that are becoming available through these genetic therapies and these stem cell therapies.
and knowing which patients should get those treatments and really understanding how they affect grain health will you know, both um, require a synergistic approach between low and high income settings and also imaging, I think, to sort of show what exactly is going on in these patients and how it's changing. And no two patients are really the same. So that's another thing I would emphasize. They're quite different. Transfusion and transplant therapy. So I talked a little bit about that and how blood flow can reduce following, especially transplants, but less so maybe with transfusions. And the idea there is that, you know, maybe the transfusion, part of what it's doing is it's changing the capillary transit time, and that will affect auction delivery to tissue, even in the absence of a, a sort of big bulk change in blood flow. So we're looking at that possibility as well. And then I talked a little bit about cord plexus perfusion as kind of a central indicator of ischemic or glial stress, um, both in vasculopathy as well as in sickle cell. So I'll go ahead and stop there. I want to thank everyone in the group um, for their help. Also you for your attention. And yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, thank you.